Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Today, while top diplomats from Ukraine and Russia were holding talks in Turkey, news came that Russia's airstrike on a maternity and children's hospital yesterday killed at least three people, including one young girl. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov addressed concerns over the airstrike earlier today. This is not the first time we have seen pathetic outcries concerning so-called atrocities by the Russian armed forces. At the UN Security Council, our delegation presented facts that this maternity hospital had long since been captured by the Azov Battalion and other radical factions, from where all expected mothers, all nurses and all personnel had been kicked out. This was a base of the ultra-radical Azov Battalion. Pathetic outcries about so-called atrocities is what he said there while claiming that the hospital was a paramilitary base and there was no there were no patients there when everyone can see in the images and video women and children being taken out of the still smoking wreckage. After bombing the hospital in Maripol in southeastern Ukraine yesterday, Russia today continued bombarding the city which has been under siege. And I want to warn you, these next images are graphic and incredibly disturbing. So many, so many people have been killed in Maripol that residents have been forced to resort to burying some people in a mass grave. And now amid all of this suffering and death, with you, which you see here on the screen and the huge flow of refugees out of the country, Ukrainian forces continue to put up a fierce resistance, including preparing for battle in the capital city of Kyiv. But Russian forces have advanced on the ground around Kyiv over the last 24 hours, and a senior defense official is telling NBC News they could now be as close as 10 miles from Kyiv's city center. Joining us now to start us off is a member of the Ukrainian parliament, Alexandra Ustinova. Thank you so much, first of all, for being here today. Thank you for inviting so what is your reaction to the Russian disinformation about the Maripol hospital airstrike and, frankly, about the entire invasion so far? Well, to be honest, we as Ukrainians are used to the Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation campaigns. Uh, I remember uh, when we have been telling the world that he doesn't need to be provoked. If he wants to invade Ukraine, he will do it one day. And that's what actually happened. Uh, everybody was telling us, do not step out, do not provoke him, do not do something that can be an escalation. But unfortunately, if Putin wants to do something, he's going to do that. And now when we see them saying there was a paramilitary hospital, and to be honest, they exactly knew what they were shooting with the bomb. Because four hours before it was done, they went out publicly on the uh, Russian TV and said that they know where the paramilitary hospital is. And that's how they were trying to explain Russians why they were shooting the maternity and children hospital. Unfortunately, to be honest, the new strategy for Putin is to kill as many civilians as he can. So we would sit down for the negotiations at the table with him. Unfortunately, this cannot be negotiated because uh, one of his main demands is a total denazification of the Ukrainian nation, which means probably that there are 40 million Nazis uh, that should be, I don't know, commit a, a, a suicide, a collective suicide, because otherwise, I don't know how we are supposed to denazificate for a 40 million uh, country. But what is happening now is uh, something unbelievable. And that's why we keep begging the world, we keep begging the United States, NATO, and other countries to protect our sky. We can fight it on the grounds, and our army has already proved that our guys are tough enough and the girls are tough enough to protect it from the land. We stopped the Russian army, but unfortunately we have a huge problem that they keep shooting the missiles, they keep shelling the cities, and you can see it right now what's the outcomes of it. So unfortunately, if we do not have the protection of the sky, the air defense system, the no-fly zone, he will continue shooting down children, women, because he needs as many deaths as he can. 
So one of the things that I heard you say there that I think is really relevant to the conversation and debate over the no-fly zone is your perspective um, as a Ukrainian. You mentioned that Putin will do what he wants to do. He will escalate things if that is what he wants to do. So unpack for us, help us understand your perspective on the no-fly zone. Um, the West and the Biden administration have said they don't want to escalate things. But what you essentially just said is if Putin wants to escalate things from his end, he will. Do you think we would end up in a no-fly zone situation eventually because of Putin's decisions? Uh, what I'm saying is it's just a matter of how many lives it's going to take before we end up in the no-fly zone, or at least the humanitarian airlift zone, when we have partially close, when we partially close the sky so we can get people out or the biggest cities to be controlled. What I'm saying also is that Putin is a psycho. The guy who goes into war without any escalation, he doesn't need to be escalated. If he wants to go with, in war with the United Nations, Oh, I'm sorry, with the NATO countries or the United States, he will do it eventually. If he wants to be a part of history like Hitler was, he will do it. And that's why what I keep telling the US and the NATO and the EU countries, you have to be the first to stop him because Ukraine, he's not going to stop in Ukraine. He will be going for Poland. He will be going to the Baltic states. And when I see the uh, President Biden saying that if he goes to any uh, NATO country, we will be the one responding. Well, we've heard the same 25 years ago as Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. We had been promised the protection from the United States, United Kingdom and Russia, which unfortunately invaded us later, that we will have the protection of our independence and sovereignty. This is not happening now. We're not asking for the NATO soldiers to come and fight on the ground. We're asking for the air defense system to protect our skies. So the missiles and the bombs are not coming at the children orphanages at the maternity hospitals so they don't shoot the kids children they don't shoot the babies and they don't shoot women because they would not let them let them leave the cities we were trying to negotiate putin to let us take children and women from mariupol city for almost a week they're not doing that because they're using these people as the human shield for his army protection. And unfortunately, we will end up having a no-fly zone. It's just a matter of how many lives it takes. And where is the red line it has so that the UN, uh, UN, uh, UN NATO or US will step in? Because now we have thousands of people dead. Probably in a week or two, we will have maybe 100,000 people dead, because he's already threatening us with the uh, chemical weapons. He's been already threatening other countries with the nuclear weapons. We have to, to be honest, the Western countries have to step in first, because we are not fighting just for our independence. We are fighting for the democracy. And if Putin wins this battle, he will not stop. He will go further to Poland, to Baltic countries. But it, it would mean that the Western world, the democracy lost to the tyranny because just one crazy cycle can demand and dictate the whole world what he wants to do, and he will do that. You mentioned the use of chemical and biological weapons. Do you think that's a real possibility that Putin would utilize those against civilians in, or, or even military in Ukraine? I'm pretty much sure he will. And to be honest, the Ukrainian government is already uh, trying to share the information about, uh, to share information among the uh, citizens, what needs to be done and how they have to react if there is nuclear, if there is, I'm sorry, chemical weapons being used. To be honest, two weeks ago, we could hardly imagine, and probably the world could hardly imagine, we would be watching the uh, execution of a European nation in the center of Europe shelled cities, bombed cities, children uh, dying in the bomb shelters because they're dehydrated and th th they cannot get out. So uh, frankly speaking, I can believe in anything. And they've already started this disinformation campaign that Ukraine actually developed some chemical weapons at the eastern part uh, of the country, which means we want to attack Russia and stuff like that. So they are preparing their population with all these disinformation campaigns that they will be using it. Alexandra Ustinova, thank you so much for being here tonight and for helping us understand the perspective of the Ukrainian uh, folks on the ground, a member of parliament. Please stay safe. Thank you again.
The ongoing daily horror that Russian forces are inflicting on Ukraine has so far led to an estimated 2.3 million people have been caused to flee the country. And with the largest number by far going to Poland, joining us is NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber, who is in Krawczyk, Poland. Ellison, lay out what is happening right now in Poland with the influx of these refugees. Every day I read a bigger number. Yeah, I mean, it's mind-boggling. We spent the last 12 days or so going to six different border crossings along the Polish-Ukrainian border, and it is just a constant flow, a constant sea of people trying to get into Poland as quickly as possible. You look at the numbers, and on paper, it is sort of hard to wrap your mind around how big these numbers are, but you think about the first seven days. The U.N. said seven days after Russia launched this war, a million people had fled Ukraine, that is unprecedented. You look back at other humanitarian crises like Syria in 2011, that's when fighting began in that country. It wasn't until 2013 that the UN said a million people had fled the country. You look at a situation like Venezuela and back in 2014, there was a lot of talk by the UN that a million people had fled the country in seven months. And they said that was a lot of people fleeing very quickly. You look at what's happening here. A million people fled in seven days. It's not even two weeks, and we're over two million now. So the numbers that we're seeing here, it really is unprecedented, and it is staggering to see it happening. You can compare the other uh, humanitarian crises, and we can look at that, and we can say, obviously, there is a situation here where Poland, neighboring countries to Ukraine, they opened their arms to refugees. And unfortunately, that was not the case in Syria or even Venezuela or other similar situations. And we should talk about why that is. But when you just look at the numbers here, what's happening is unprecedented because it is so many people in a really, really short period of time. Serlina? What are the people telling you um, that you're talking to on the ground there about the conditions that led them to leave their homes and end up where you are. The thing that we can't say enough is that no one, whether it's here or another refugee crisis, no one wants to be a refugee. Every time you talk to people at these makeshift refugee camps as they're crossing the border, they will tell you they left because they had no other choice and they want to go home as soon as possible. Most of the people that we're seeing here crossing the border, it's it's women and children because men who are fighting age, they have to stay in Ukraine to fight. And I have spoken to eight-year-olds who talk about what they had to see, the noise as they heard, the things they saw, the fears they had trying to make it to Poland. I talked to a 16-year-old yesterday, and she uh, she was from eastern Ukraine, Kharkiv, and she talked about how they'd spent days hunkering down because they didn't feel like it was safe enough to leave. There hadn't been enough of a pause in the shelling to be able to get to a train station. When they finally felt like they could leave, she talked to me about helping her mother get her three younger siblings out of their home. She told her younger siblings, don't look up, just run. I mean, the stories that we're hearing, they are so similar and then so different at the same time, but it's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of people right now just trying to figure out what they need to do immediately to keep themselves and their family safe. But what's happening here, it, it really is beyond words. Zerlina. Ellison Barber, thank you so much for that really, really critical reporting from on the ground. Thank you so much for being here tonight. As we go to break, I want to tell you the story of this 11-year-old Ukrainian refugee. He traveled about 620 miles to Slovakia by himself, seeking a safe haven from the Russia invasion. All he had with him was a plastic bag, a passport, and a telephone number written down on his hand. His mother sent him off on his own because their town is near one of the nuclear plants that Russia took over, and she could not leave her ailing mother. Along the boy's journey, volunteers took care of him. And once he made it out of Ukraine, volunteers reached out to the telephone number scribbled on his little hand and reunited him with his siblings. And sadly, this isn't the first time this young boy has fled war. The Washington Post reports his family also fled the war in Syria about a decade ago and they settled in Ukraine. We'll be right back.
As we discuss what more the West can do about the crisis in Ukraine, it's important to take note of how attitudes towards Russia have evolved. More specifically, how Republican attitudes towards Putin have taken a complete 180. Much of the Trump presidency was clouded by overtures to and from Mas Moscow, arguably the most consequential to the horrors we see unfolding today, Donald Trump blocked payments of a congressionally mandated Ukrainian military aid package in exchange for President Zelensky digging up some dirt on Joe Biden and his family, a request that got Trump impeached. In that hearing, his first impeachment hearing, to be clear, Republicans defended the president. Corruption is not just prevalent in Ukraine, it's the system. So our president said, time out, time out. Let's check out this new guy. Let's see if Zelensky's the real deal. This new guy who got elected in April, whose party took power in July. Let's see if he's legitimate. This, while Democrats argued why the aid was historically necessary to help Ukraine defend its national integrity and territorial integrity. Well, we should care about Ukraine. They're an ally of ours. If it matters to us, we should care about the fact that in 1994, when we asked them to give up their nuclear weapons that they had inherited from the Soviet Union, we said, hey, if you give them up, which you don't want to do because you're worried the Russians might invade, if you give them up, we will help assure your territorial integrity. We made that commitment. I hope we care about that. And now, more than two weeks into the war, in the face of disturbing images and showing brutal, the brutal consequences of the Russia invasion, a new poll shows 66% of Republicans are blaming, blaming Vladimir Putin for the war, while prominent Republicans are backing away from Trump's claim that Putin is, quote, savvy for invading. And joining me now to talk about this and the Republican Party's pivot on Putin is Miles Taylor, former DHS chief of staff. So, Miles, do Republicans remember that they said all of that on video? Do they remember the fact pattern from the first impeachment? I've been a little bit obsessed with this over the course of the last two weeks, given the relevance of the exact set of facts that led to the first impeachment. I mean, what is your reaction to their complete 180 on this? Well, I mean, Zerlina, it's it's breathtaking, and it's sort of hard to even wrap your head around it because even a Hollywood screenwriter would never suggest a storyline that's as crazy as this one is an ex-president of the United States, pressures a foreign leader, threatens to withhold aid if he doesn't dig up dirt on his political rival. His political rival ends up winning that election, and then, you know, he goes out there and starts to talk uh, say good things about the adversary who's invading that rival. I mean, again, it sounds like a, a B plot in a Hollywood film, but this is reality. And this is Donald Trump's Republican Party. It is not uh, facetious to say there is a pro-Putin wing of the GOP, even though a, a majority of Republicans nationwide say they blame Putin for the war. Go look at what Republican leaders are saying, not just Donald Trump, but just the other day, Madison Cawthorn, a Republican member of Congress, called Zelensky a thug. We had a senior official in the Trump administration go on TV and say that Russia has gone too easy on the Ukrainians. We, of course, have Donald Trump's words himself, where he has praised Vladimir Putin as savvy, as a genius. It's really tough to walk those back. And these uh, you know, allies of Donald Trump are twisting themselves in knots to explain it. It would be one thing if these people were just expressing their own opinions and not affecting the views of Americans. But the problem here, Zerlina, is they're affecting the views of Americans. Another poll a few days ago came out and asked uh, respondents whether they thought Joe Biden was a strong leader or Putin was a stronger leader. Only one third of Americans thought Biden was the stronger one. Another third of Americans thought Putin was a stronger leader. That's very alarming that one third of this country would say that our you know, geopolitical adversary, Vladimir Putin, is a stronger leader than our president of the United States. So it's having an impact and a detrimental impact uh, on our politics. I mean, I just like going down the memory hole, it feels like, like you said, it does feel like it's, it's like a B plot, like a really bad screenplay that didn't get made. 
Um, and I and I want everybody. I want to put these folks up on the screen. Like let's 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 look, show faces and name names. Remember these people. These are eight members of Congress. These are the Republicans on your screen right now. In 2018, they decided to celebrate America's Independence Day by exercising their freedom to spend July the 4th in Moscow, Russia, earning them the internet title Moscow Mules, which is a fun play on the joke, uh, a fun joke on uh, of the drink, Moscow Mule. Um, and point of fact, this actually happened the day after the Senate Intel Committee affirmed that Russia interfered in the election in 2016, of which I was a staffer. I mean... Speak to this idea that Putin's propaganda during this invasion, it stopped working, but it was working all the way up to basically now. It was working so well, they had invaded the United States with their propaganda. They disrupted a presidential election. They had ongoing influence over our political system to the point that the commander in chief himself felt beholden to Vladimir Putin. And that's not me spouting off political talking points. I lived it. I lived trying to convince this man, Donald Trump, that we needed to go hard on Russia because we were under attack. He would not listen. He would not listen to us. And in fact, he wanted us to stop talking about Russia. He wanted to fire our senior officials that were really, really anti-Russia and focused on pushing back against Moscow. We were told by senior aides to Donald Trump not to bring the country up in his presence anymore. I mean, this is this is absurd. It's not just willful ignorance. It was him playing for the other team. And, you know, it still baffles me to have to say that, but we have to say it like it is. I mean, on any given day, we weren't sure whether Donald Trump was playing for Team USA or playing for Team Russia. That's, that's an extraordinary concern when you're talking about anyone in elected office, but we're talking about the president of the United States here. He did not want to push back against Putin. He wanted to cut deals with Putin. In his words, he would look at us in these meetings and say, Vladimir Putin is our friend. That was the policy of the United States under Donald Trump. And look where it got us. I think there's a direct correlation between what we're seeing in Ukraine, the devastation, and what Donald Trump failed to do during his administration. By not standing up to Putin, he sent a message, which was, don't worry, the West won't do anything if you invade. Now, it's good the Biden administration has been pushing back in a strong way, but Putin hadn't learned that lesson. The lesson he learned from the four years of Trump was go ahead and do what you want. America will look the other way. And now we have a total disaster on our hands and something that quite literally could spiral into a third world war if it's not well contained. It's also concerning, but I've linked it directly back to the first impeachment and I just cannot believe that that was the, I mean, historians are gonna run wild. <laughs> they are gonna not, I mean, historians in the future and children learning this point, this period of American history are gonna whew, shake their heads like we are. Miles Taylor, thank you so much for being here tonight and helping us talk through all of that. Um, I like to hold people accountable for what they've done and, and I appreciate uh, your commentary. Please stay safe. So the Senate, as soon as possible, as, as soon as tonight, excuse me, could pass a government funding bill that would provide nearly $14 billion in aid for Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are fighting for their lives and fighting for the survival of their young democracy. Congress has a moral obligation to stand behind them as they resist the evils of Vladimir Putin and his campaign of carnage. The money will go towards humanitarian efforts as well as weapon shipments and troop deployments. And more, it's more than double the amount initially requested by the Biden administration. And it's on top of the more than $1 billion in security assistance the U.S. and our European allies have sent to Ukraine so far. And those resources have proven crucial to Ukraine's efforts to resist Russia's invasion. But will it be enough to end this war? Ukraine's president has suggested that he doesn't think so. He's criticized Washington for nixing a deal that would have that would have had the U.S. coordinate a transfer of fighter jets from Poland to Ukraine. He also repeatedly called for a new fly zone, another idea the United States has rejected. Joining me now to break this all down, Olena Prokopenko. She's a visiting fellow for the German Marshall Fund and the co-founder of the Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine. Thank you for being here. Everyone wants the West to do more, but we're also aware of the reasons for hesitancy to escalate tensions more and more and more. 
What more do you think the United States and allies can do that we aren't doing already? Well, I must admit that despite the uh, unprecedented uh, severity and unity of the Western sanctions, they are still too weak and too slow to deter Russian aggression. They could have been uh, adequate and proportional in 2014 when Russia um, uh, annexed Crimea and um, uh, invaded uh, a part of Donbass in the east of Ukraine. But now, in the midst of a full-fledged invasion on Ukraine, uh, the response uh, has to be so much stronger. Um, first and foremost, we urgently need uh, NATO to enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Uh, this will enable a safe evacuation of millions of Ukrainians, including women and children, who are still waiting to to be relocated to safer places. This would prevent uh, further civilian losses, which already are insurmountable, and this would also uh, safeguard critical infrastructure in Ukraine. We also uh, absolutely need the West to increase uh, military assistance to Ukraine. Um, we need uh, advanced air and missile protection uh, systems, fighter jets, drones, to protect um, our sky. Um, with this in mind, our transatlantic task force has already urged U.S. Congress to promptly uh, pass a comprehensive um, emergency assistance, assistance package that you just mentioned earlier to meet Ukraine's uh, security, humanitarian, uh, economic, energy, cyber, uh, and other critical needs. Um, besides, it's crucial that uh, the Financial um, Action Task Force blacklist Russia and Belarus as state sponsors of terrorism, which they are, um, and block all international transactions with these states. Uh, there's also a list of other steps we want the West to, to enforce, uh, and one of the most critical would be to cut off diplomatic ties with Russia, to exclude Russia from all international organizations, disconnect Russia from SWIFT, uh, introduce trade embargo with, with Russia, uh, freeze assets of its government and oligarchs and their families, of course, and ban their entry to the Western countries. And there are also, uh, there's also an urgent need that I want to flag, uh, which we have less than 24 hours to address, and it has to do with the Chernobyl nuclear power plant um, occupied by the Russian forces right now. Uh, it has been uh, disconnected from uh, the electricity supply and the cooling systems uh, of the storage facility for spent uh, nuclear fuel um, are about to stop operating, uh, making radiation leaks imminent. So we call on the international community to um, demand Russia to cease fire and allow repair works uh, to to, to restore power, because otherwise, not only Ukraine, but mm -hmm. the whole Europe will face a danger of a nuclear uh, disaster. And of course, there are humanitarian needs to be addressed uh, that we want um, the West to, to assist Ukraine with. Um, and uh, at the same time, we realize that it's important to address this humanitarian crisis on the level of its root causes. Mm -hmm. uh, if we close the sky now, if we, um, if we equip Ukraine to win uh, with the uh, uh, advanced weapons. We will not have to deal with new waves of refugees, with new waves of humanitarian crisis already in the near future. In terms of that humanitarian piece, I mean, I think that uh, we were talking to Ellison Barber, who's in Poland, just about the unprecedented numbers of refugees um, that we're seeing um, flee for their lives, literal lives. Um, in terms of what long term uh, things that need to be set up now, that infrastructure for the long-term care um, for all of those millions of people. Um, what do you see as some of the steps United States and allies sh should be taking in this moment, right now, to address you know, what, what will predictably be an ongoing crisis, and those numbers are going to continue to grow? Well, I know this... Uh this situation all, all too well, because my family and I have just fled Ukraine uh, a few days ago, and we are currently in Riga. And it took us a whole week to relocate from Kiev because we could not drive due to the uh, due to how dangerous um, uh, driving through Ukraine was. So we took uh, trains and, and, and buses, and uh, we're finally in a safe place. Uh, but of course, um, um, millions of Ukrainians who are just like us relocating to uh, European uh, and other uh, states uh, don't have uh, a planning horizon longer than uh, a few weeks from now. And um, 
as of right now, it's important to make sure that they have a simplified access to uh, protection in the states that uh, are uh, accepting them right now. I think this is number one um, a step. And also, uh, it's very important to take care uh, of the needs, urgent needs of Ukrainians who are still uh, in Ukraine under the bombs, under the shellings uh, on a daily basis. And it's, it's critical to um, ensure that uh, humanitarian corridors are uh, secured and people can be safely evacuated and, uh, and critical supplies of foods and medicines and and other um, uh, essentials are are also there because uh, many Ukrainian cities are already uh, on the brink of humanitarian right. catastrophe and some are already facing it uh, right now. Elena Prokopenko, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your perspective. I'm so glad to hear that you and your family were able um, to escape safely and of course. Um, we hope that that is true for, for all um, Ukrainian families. Thank you again for being here. Please keep us updated um, as you get more information about the situation on the ground. Please stay safe. Coming up, how far is Putin willing to go in his invasion of Ukraine amid worries by U.S. administration officials that Russia could be preparing to use chemical or biological weapons. I'm gonna to talk to General Barry McCaffrey about all of that when we're back. By many accounts, the Ukrainian military has been successful in its efforts to at least delay what Vladimir Putin assumed would be a quick toppling of its government. While Moscow's targeting of civilian areas like Maripol has only ramped up, their advance into Ukraine has been slow. But that doesn't mean they haven't made progress. A senior defense official tells NBC News Russian forces are now within 10 miles from Kyiv city center along one route. And that's one on top of a current U.S. assessment that Russian forces are still capable of encircling Kyiv in one to two weeks, with the battle for the city taking much longer. But there are concerns that the more this war goes on, the more Ukraine puts up a fight, the more drastic measures Putin may take. And today, at the Senate Intel Committee's annual hearing on worldwide, worldwide threats, CIA Director William Burns expressed concerns that Putin could soon turn to biological and chemical weapons after he falsely accused Ukraine of developing them. This is something, as, as all of you know very well, is very much a part of Russia's playbook. They've used those weapons against their own citizens. Um, they've at least encouraged the use in Syria and elsewhere. So it's something we take very seriously. Joining me now is retired U.S. Army General Barry McCaffrey. He's an NBC, MSNBC military analyst. So, General, break down what exactly chemical and biological weapons are. What are we talking about here and how real of a threat it, is it? Well, it's an astonishing situation, Zerlina. The You know, I was part of the negotiating team that signed the Biological Weapons Convention and the Chemical Warfare uh, Treaty also. They're both bans. Uh, both Russia and the United States signed these treaties. Uh, we committed ourselves to destroying all stockpiles of chemicals in particular, and there were thousands of metric tons in both nations. So in theory, the Russians don't have them. But they were used in Syria uh, with, I think, Russian acquiescence, if not involvement. Uh, they're not a very good weapon against trained militaries. You know, I'm, I've been trained in a, a nerve agent, live agent uh, facility. Uh, the U.S. Armed Forces can fight in a chemical environment pretty effectively. But against civilian targets, they would be devastating. I would tell you, if the Russians make the uh, terrible war criminal uh, action of using these weapons against civilians, I would predict we will enter the war full force in Ukraine. What's stopping Vladimir Putin from doing that? Well, I, I don't believe uh, he's going to do that. My guess would be the false flag operation would be a small outbreak of either bioweapons, allegedly, or chemical weapons, followed by another justification for the war. And by the way, some of this nonsense, and it's utter nonsense, 
uh, that Ukraine was developing these weapons with U.S. Uh, assistance, you know, coming out of Fox TV, uh, just astonishing. There's no truth to that. So I think the only possibility I see is that the Russians would claim this as a justification for these terrible attacks uh, on Ukrainian uh, civil centers. It's important to understand that. In general, a senior U.S. official told NBC News that Russian forces could encircle Kyiv in less than two weeks. We've been tracking, obviously, that 40-mile-long convoy and other uh, troops uh, tr making their way. Um, but it's taking a lot longer uh, than expected, and it's been more challenging. I mean, what do you think the next couple of weeks look like? It's hard to know. The uh, ratio of power clearly overwhelmingly favors uh, the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainian Air Force is, is modest in size. They've lost a lot of it. Uh, Ru Russia is willing to use massed artillery and rockets on civil uh, centers. And by the way, I think this is clearly their objective, is to break the morale of the civilian population, forcing Ukraine uh, to surrender. Uh, so it's hard to know how this is going to come out. Ukrainians are enormously effective and courageous using these smart munitions we've given them, javelin, stinger, uh, landmines, small arms ammunition, where we're feeding them intelligence. Uh, I assume we're also uh, helping them in, in other ways that we don't want to make public. We're certainly helping the refugee population and putting food and rations into Ukraine. Uh, but. Sherlina, the situation is grim. Um, the Ukrainians are desperate. They want us to intervene by air, not with air caps or humanitarian uh, corridors. They really need a massed air power strike, they think, uh, to give them breathing room. And Biden, correctly, in my view, isn't going to do that. What do you think Biden is more likely to do? I mean, do you agree with the Biden administration that that's not the right approach. I mean, we've spoke, we've talked to multiple um, folks tonight who are giving that perspective from the Ukrainian side that the no-fly in some form is an eventuality, and in the meantime, Ukrainians are dying. Um, what is your response to that line of uh, and that perspective and, and line of argument um, in, in the context of this debate over the no-fly zone? Well, great uh, empathy. This is a humanitarian disaster. These civil populations are not being defended adequately, particularly from cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, plus uh, bombing campaigns. That was the bomb outside the maternity hospital was clearly uh, a large sized delayed action aerial bomb. Uh, so they're desperate. Uh, but look, there's no such thing as a no fly zone. We either go in to dominate Ukraine's airspace, and that would include ground attacks against the S-400 Russian uh, air defense system inside Russia, as well as air defense units that engage us in the ground inside Ukraine. It would be war against the Russian. That's the president's dilemma. He doesn't want to widen the war. NATO won't entertain the option either. General Baird McCaffrey, always great to talk to you to help us understand the latest. Please stay safe. Thank you again for being here. Good be. As the crisis in Ukraine worsens back here at home, inflation is still climbing at a record pace. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it rose to 7.9 percent through the month of February due to rising prices for food, rent, and yes, gasoline. But the full impact of rising gas prices won't be known until next month, since current data only reflects the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that doesn't that didn't stop President Biden from blaming Vladimir Putin, saying in a statement, quote, today's inflation report is a reminder that Americans budgets are being stretched by price increases and families are starting to feel the impacts of Putin's price hike. A large contributor to inflation this month was an increase in gas and energy prices as markets reacted to Putin's aggressive action. Joining me now is Robert Reich. He's a former labor secretary and is now a public policy professor at UC Berkeley. He's also the co-founder of Inequality Media. And Secretary Reich, I want to start off with what Senator Mitch McConnell said on the Senate floor earlier today about inflation. Let's take a listen to that. 
But in the last few days, the Biden administration has tried to invent some laugh out loud, laugh out loud revisionist history. <clears throat> They're trying to rebrand the entire increase in gas prices on their watch, listen to this, as an effect of Putin's recent invasion of Ukraine. <clears throat> so they want to blame 14 months of gas price increases on the last two weeks of turmoil. Washington Democrats' war on domestic energy long, long predates Putin's war on Ukraine. So everybody's talking about inflation, but help us understand how much of it is tied to the global picture of what's happening. Obviously, we all are aware we're in a global pandemic. We're all watching on our screens the invasion of Ukraine, and people are talking about how that's going to make gas more expensive. Is is that is all of that um, contributing to inflation? How and how so? There really are four factors that are driving inflation right now. One big one is demand. I mean, consumers still are coming out of the pandemic. They have some money. Most consumers uh, didn't spend all that much during the pandemic. And there's a great pent-up demand for goods, uh, not so much for services. And that's the issue, because as consumers move back to demand for... Oh, Secretary, I, don't, I actually don't want people to miss your answer. Is that your phone? Because I just checked my phone. It's not my phone. Is it your phone ringing? I don't think I don't I don't think uh, I think President Biden tries to get me, you know, every hour or so. But I don't think he's trying. <laughs> possible. Uh, as, I don't know. It's not completely my phone. possible. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I just I wanted to make sure people were completely concentrated on your answer. So just to restate the question much quicker, um, how much of inflation is tied to what's happening around the world? Uh, a lot of a lot of it, most of it is, is pandemic related, uh, because as we come out of the pandemic, a lot of people uh, are, you know, they have a lot of demand for a lot of goods that they were not able to get during the pandemic. They have some saving. Uh, they're also supply bottlenecks, and they are still supply bottlenecks. And then on top of that, you've got uh, monopolization. Some big companies, uh, food companies, for example, uh, have monopolized for for quite some time, and right now they are really driving prices up. They're taking advantage of this increased demand for food. And then on top of that, the fourth factor is obviously energy prices. I mean, one of the things that I've learned in reading up on inflation, which really wasn't a thing that I, you know, I can't say that I had intimate knowledge of inflation um, before it became cause celeb. I mean, I took economics, but I don't remember um, a, a lot of that. I mean, is is this the kind of crisis that the president in the United States can fix through policy? Or is this the kind of crisis um, that it takes everyone implementing policies all over the world, um, particularly because we're seeing directly um, events on the ground in Ukraine have contributed to those rising energy prices, which then trickles down to the price of everything else. Uh, Zerlina, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, uh, housing, for example, uh, housing prices have been going up for years. And that's mainly because the big millennial generation uh, is moving into the housing market. And, you know, they were born in the 1980s. They all want their housing or they are driving up rents. Uh, the second issue is energy. And obviously, that is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, energy prices were going up uh, to some extent, obviously, before uh, the Russian invasion. Uh, the Russian invasion, but there was an anticipation of that Russian invasion. We all knew that there was a chance that was pushing up energy futures. And then on top of that, you've got food prices. Those are the three big ones. In fact, energy and food and housing account for about 63% of the typical family's budget. And if you've got all three of them going up simultaneously, you've got a perfect yeah. storm. That makes so much sense because it's not like, especially people on fixed incomes or people that, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck. If gas prices go up or if it costs more money to get to the job than it, than it does to get paid for the job, that presents a very big problem for you and your family. I mean, how does corporate power impact this? You mentioned that it, um, it, at the top of your uh, first answer about corporate consolidation impacting inflation and the prices that people are paying um, for everyday products. Um, break that down for us. How, how does that contribute to this? 
Well, if corporations, big corporations, were really competitive, if they had to worry about losing consumers if they raise their prices, they'd do everything they could not to raise their prices. And even they would absorb supply shocks, even if they're paying more for certain supplies coming from abroad uh, or wherever, uh, they would try to absorb those rather than simply pass those price increases on to consumers. But they're not. In fact, across America, big corporations are using this period of time to raise their prices, even though they're hugely profitable. In fact, we haven't seen a period of time where corporations, big corporations, have generated this much profit. Uh, if they were not monopolies, if they were truly in competition, they would not simply pass these prices on to consumers. And that's a big factor. Uh, it's not easily remedied. I mean, antitrust laws take some time to work through the system. But I think one thing this should teach us is that big corporations have simply too much pricing power. Secretary Robert Reich, always great to have you on to help us understand this stuff. Uh, you explain it better than, than most, most people I know, honestly. I understand it, which is saying a lot. Thank you again for being here, and please stay safe. Coming up, trying to leave Ukraine amidst the war is a treacherous one. But, but imagine trying to do it if you're already fighting for your life after being diagnosed with cancer. We're going to have that story when we're back. Over 2 million people have fled Ukraine since the start of Russia's onslaught. And the U.N. says the number of refugees could double to 4 million people forced to flee by the end of the war. The journey out of Ukraine in the middle of an escalating conflict is a difficult one that most people, even the healthy and strong ones, find very difficult to bear. My next guest has been doing incredible reporting on the ground in Ukraine, and he's also helping to escort families out of danger and into neighboring countries, including one woman undergoing cancer treatment who was asked to leave a hospital to make room for people injured in the war. I hope that this uh, transportation will help me to survive. Uh, it increases chances uh, at least twice, as doctors uh, here say. So, um, I need to try. You need to to book place for yourself and uh, to stay in a queue to wait for uh, vital treatment. Uh, it's unbearable. Joining me now is Terrell Jermaine Starr. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and host of the Black Diplomats podcast. Terrell, um, you helped Irina seek safety, and today you tweeted that you can help any foreign students needing to get to the border how have you been helping people get out of Ukraine? I mean, how difficult is it to get out? Well, as long as you're not in a... Thank you for having me on the show again. It's, it's always a pleasure. Uh, now, as long as you're not in a conflict zone or an area where um, where Ukrainians um, um, basically are fighting to liberate the city, uh, you can get out so long as you have transportation from your location, be it through government-sanctioned trains to the nearest uh, border town, or if you're doing what I am doing, is helping people to find transport, where I'm literally in the car with them getting from point A to point B, point B being the border area. Uh, what makes that challenging is that you need to, one, know that there's going to be an aid organization on the other side of the border, be it Poland, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, to, to to receive you. And you also need to brace for a day or two of travel, make sure that you have your right context and make sure that somebody will be able to receive you um, once you, you know, uh, um, during that journey, because it's not about money or, or finances, it's about having a network of people who you trust. And I've found these people through my, um, my own personal networks on Twitter, and uh, that's been very helpful. Also, having money to keep maintain gas, one gas, one, one tank of gas will usually take you um, on the journeys that I've gone, but now it takes about four tanks, uh, making sure that you have the right food to get there, but making sure logistically that you have everything lined up because everything is so unpredictable right now that you really need to have people on your um, in your Rolodex willing to help you because you can't do 
you can't make a, a across the trip, across the country journey on your own. In terms of the situation on the ground, I mean, how is it escalating from your perspective? Well, it's only escalating because uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is essentially losing this war. And so he's basically bombing people to death because if it were up to an, you know, a conventional army to conventional army, the Russians are losing in that regard. And so you see more civilian targets being hit, but whether it be um, residential buildings, whether that is hospitals or any other civilian site. I actually have reported for MSNBC from sites where um, where, where, where Russians where Russians have hit uh, civilian locations. And so that's a primary escalation. And again, that's happening because Putin, with his um, second largest, most powerful military on the world, has a very poorly planned uh, invasion. And the Ukrainians are exploiting that. And the only way that Putin knows how to respond is by hitting civilian targets that have nothing to do with the war, with the military offensive. In terms of whether or not you think he's doing it intentionally, I mean, you're on the ground, right? So you're able to actually see, at least in some of these cases, um, the civilians walking around and, and, and the, what these targets actually look like before. Um, do you think he's doing it on purpose, intentionally targeting civilians um, with these attacks? Yes. Yes, in fact, if you go on um, Russian-speaking telegram or Ukrainian telegram channels, you will see soldiers who were captured, and they will tell you directly that they were given orders to shoot civilians. Now, some people would say that these soldiers are being told to say this under duress. I don't think that is true. And so if you go to Russian language telegram, um, I think that's a lot where, where a lot of access to the West is being cut off through language. But if you go to those sources, you will see Russian soldiers essentially confirming that they've been told to hit Russian, uh, to, to hit civilian targets. So I, I think that we can verify that as a fact, at least through those um, telegram channels that are um, run by Ukrainian journalists and analysts um, um, featuring soldiers who have been caught. Now, he definitely has done this in the past when you look at Syria when you look at Chechnya and the second, um, the second was Chechen war. And so hitting civilian targets has been consistent with how the Russian army operates, particularly if they're losing. So we can, you know, at, at any rate, I don't think that Russia will outright admit to any of this. You pretty much just have to look at what's clearly seen as a, a you know, a, a, as direct hits, because from what I have seen and from what my colleagues have seen on the ground, it's clear that he is hitting targets that are well beyond conflict areas or, conf or, or, or battle conflicts. Hmm. Terrell Jermaine Starr, thank you so much. From your very important perspective on the ground in Ukraine, please stay safe and keep us updated um, as you uh, try to consistently help people get out of Ukraine. Thank you again. That is it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after a short break right here on The Choice from MSNBC. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.